saints, peace, grace, and love of Christ Jesus be with everyone. I hope everyone's having a fantastic summer out there. If you happen to hear some background noise, that would be the uh, air conditioner. So I apologize beforehand. Now, in our last study, we covered Acts chapter 20, which was some time ago, and I apologize for that as well. We have eight more chapters, uh, and this would be one out of seven more, covering over 30 plus years of the Apostle Paul's ministry. The transition from the gospel of the kingdom to the mystery that was revealed to Paul by our Lord Jesus and this mystery is what we know today as the gospel of grace. So, in chapter 20, we saw Paul traveling through Macedonia and Greece. And Paul wrote 2 Corinthians and Romans during the end of that time and during this chapter. And we also saw that Paul last visited the city of Trouts and how Paul spent the entire day on Sunday, the first day of the week, all night into Monday morning, Paul teaches them all about this mystery. And we also saw a young man by the name of Eutychus who was listening to Paul preach all day, all night, into the wee hours of the morning. And poor Eutychus falls asleep during Paul's preaching. And it's not something unusual because at some time or other, I'm sure, I'm sure everyone, and it's okay to admit it, We've all been there early Sunday morning. So, unfortunately, he was sitting on a windowsill when he fell asleep and he falls three stories down to the ground. Eutychus dies by falling out of the window and he's brought back to life by Paul. And this is one of the, one of the, just one of the supernatural miracles that Paul performs. And this miracle happened to be witnessed by the by Luke who happens to be the best witness you can have in this situation because Luke is a physician and of all people out there that you'd want in to be there in this situation Luke would would be that person Luke would know if a person was really dead or not right and we know Luke of course wrote the book of Acts and Luke wrote that Eutychus fell from the third loft and he was taken up dead. Not injured, but D-E-A-D, -E dead. So we know that this was indeed a miracle that our Lord performed through the Apostle Paul. Then Paul and company, they head to Ephesus. They head south. Paul says, says goodbye to the church leaders from Ephesus in verse 17 through 38. And we read that there were many tears. There was much crying involved because the believers in Ephesus knew that this was the last time they were going to see Paul. So it was a very sad moment for everybody involved. And now that brings us to chapter 21 in the book of Acts. In the first verse, And it came to pass that after we were gotten from them and had launched, we came with a straight course unto Coos, and the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence unto Patera. And finding a ship sailing over unto Phoenicia, we went aboard and set forth. Now, something to take notice of here, is just like from the last study, is the word we, W-E. And it's here for a reason. It's being used here over and over again in this chapter, which means Luke, the author, is traveling along with Paul. Luke is an eyewitness to everything that's about to transpire. In verse 3, Now when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand and sailed into Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unlade her burden. They emptied the ship in Tyre. And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days. Who said to Paul through the Spirit, that he should not go up to Jerusalem. And when he had accomplished those days, those seven days, we departed and went our way, and they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city, and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. And verse 6, And, we, and when we 
had taken our leave of one another, we took ship, and they returned home again. And when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to Ptolemus and saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, this is Agabus, Agabus, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break my heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, The will of the Lord be done. And after those days, we took up our carriages and went up to Jerusalem. There went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea, and brought with them one Manasin of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. Now, at this point, I'd like to point out a couple things. Here, we're given a clear picture of the differences between the kingdom program and the grace program. Now, what do I mean by that? Notice three things in verse 20. First, the brethren here, along with James, are Jews. This is the little flock under the same gospel that our Lord Jesus preached, the same gospel that Peter is preaching, and the same gospel that John the Baptist has preached, and the same gospel that the other apostles are preaching. They're still preaching the kingdom gospel here. They're not preaching Paul's gospel of grace, faith alone, without the law. They were zealous of the law. They're preaching the law. So they're preaching another gospel. Second, they're all believing Jews who believe in the kingdom program that Jesus is the Messiah, that they all need to repent, be baptized, and endure in good works, which is the law, to the end. That is their program. Third, their program, their method of worship here is belief plus the law or belief plus works. So, this program or gospel of belief plus works is again the kingdom program. Don't forget, all the believers here in the book of Acts, regardless of the programs, all believe that they're in the last days and Daniel's 70th week is about to begin. That the day of the Lord is upon them. They have no knowledge of an extra 2,000 years of grace. Not even Paul knows about another 2,000 years before the second coming. They all assume they're in those final days, the day of the Lord. They're all assuming that the day of the Lord prophesied about is at hand. Now, proof that they had no knowledge of an extra 2,000 years or when the day of the Lord would be is found in Acts chapter 1, verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, they're speaking to Lord Jesus here, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They knew that the restoration of Israel's kingdom would come after Daniel's 70th week. They knew all about the prophecies concerning the day of the Lord and so on, and they're asking Jesus, when? 
is this all going to take place? We follow in Acts chapter 1 verse 7, And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons, the year or the months, which the Father hath put in his own power. They didn't know exactly when this was going to take place, but they're all assuming that it's not too far in their future, especially 2,000 years later. So we see Paul's dispensation of grace and the dispensation of the kingdom, keeping in mind that the book of Acts is all about the diminishing of the kingdom program and the rising of the grace program from the Jews' promises and prophecies to Paul's mysteries and grace. And they're all under the assumption that they're living out in the last days. Now, if you ever wondered how people, and I get this question a lot, how are people going to live during Daniel's 70th week, during the tribulation period? Well, if you've ever wondered how they're going to live and how they're going to worship God during Daniel's 70th week after the rapture, then all you have to do is study and note how they, the little flock, Peter's group of Jewish believers, were worshiping God during the transition in the book of Acts. Okay, they're going to be worshiping the same way in Daniel's 70th week. The kingdom program is all about belief plus works. Belief plus the law. Producing the fruit, or the oil if you will, that will be considered at the end of Daniel's 70th week at the second coming. It's all about faith plus being zealous of the law, which will be more important during Daniel's 70th week. But it's not important for us today because we're not in that program. Today, it's all about grace, not the law or works. Also, all the miracles and signs, the healings, the supernatural gifts that you see in the book of Acts were all part of the kingdom program to help them survive Daniel's 70th week help them stay alive during the days of the Lord. During They have to survive that period. So God gives them a supernatural ability to stay alive, to heal people, to cure people's diseases, to feed people with manna, to bring people back from the dead. All these supernatural miracles, soup and signs and, and all these wonders are going to happen again during Daniel's 70th week in the kingdom program and to add all these same miracles and signs wonders will commence once again of course after the rapture after the close of the age of grace in acts 21 verse 21 and they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the jews which are among the gentiles to forsake moses saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. Now, the word forsake here in verse 21 is the word apostasia. The word apostasia is used twice in the King James Version Bible, once here in Acts 21, 21, and another time in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And in both instances, in both verses, they mean apostasia. They mean the very same thing. Now, let's look at that real quick. The word forsake here in Acts 21, 21 means apostasia. It means apostasy, right? It means defection. And in this situation, it's meaning a defection from the faith, a falling away from faith, a departure from faith, a spiritual departure. It does not mean a physical departure as in the word harpazo. Apostasia is one word, harpazo is another word. They don't mean the same thing at all, okay? So the word forsake and apostasia in Second Thessalonians, uh, in verse three, let no man deceive you by any means for that day. Now that day that they're speaking of here is the day of Christ, the second coming, okay? Shall not come except there come a falling away, a apostasia first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called god or that is worshiped so that he as god sitteth in the temple of god showing himself that he is god now if you take a look at another video that i made on second thessalonians 2 the title 
is the falling away dash apostasia dash what is it? Question mark. Closed quote. Now I explain what Paul was talking about in further detail in that video. It's a short video. Perhaps I'll make a more detailed version of that video in the future. We'll see. Now, but for the purposes of this video or in this study, we need to take a look at the phrase that day and falling away. Okay. And also the order of events as outlined by Paul in that verse. It's a very important. We understand what we're reading. We know according to the prophetic scriptures, immediately after the rapture, God will allow a deception, a delusion to fall upon those on the earth. This power of deception, this delusion will be given to the Antichrist and his cohorts specifically to deceive those who didn't believe prior to the rapture. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed. When is he revealed? At the middle of Daniel's 70th week, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's at the second coming. Even him whose coming is after the workings of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. That they might be saved. Okay, verse 11. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion. That's the deception here, okay? And that's during the first half of Daniel's 70th week. Th that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now look at verse 11. Shall send them strong delusion. We already know that the strong delusion spoken about here is brought upon the earth only after the first seal is broken, only after the body of Christ is removed, and after the dispensation of grace has come to a close. It's this deception, this, this delusion that will cause them on the earth, those on the earth, to believe the lie that will cause them to fall away. The falling away here, guess what word it is? Apostasia. The departure from the truth of the kingdom gospel that Jesus is the Messiah and he's Lord of Lords, their King of Kings. And then once the Antichrist is exposed, we read in Revelation, that the world is warned by an angel not to take his mark, the mark of the beast. So, in both uses of the word apostasia, we see a clear definition of a spiritual departure, okay? A falling away of the faith. Much different than a physical departure, which Paul uses the word harpazo for. Again, two different words. The word harpazo, the word apostasia are two words with two very different meanings. The word apostasia is used twice in the King James Version Bible, and the word harpazo, not only used by our Apostle Paul, but in fact, the word harpazo is used 17 times in 13 verses from Matthew to Revelation. Yes. Let's look at some of those verses. I'm gonna throw a bunch of verses on the screen I'm not going to read them all, but I'm going to put them up there so you can read them. If you want to pause the video, you can take a look at it, or you can go back and you can study them out, okay? Let's take a look at uh, Matthew 13, 19. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth it, catcheth away. This phrase, catcheth away, is the word harpazo, that which was sown in his heart, this is he which received the seed by the wayside, okay? So something was sown in his heart, belief, the seed, right? Sown in his heart, and it was ca caught away. It was taken out. It was snatched out. It was harpazoed out physically, okay? Now, in John six fifteen, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force, again, Harpazo, okay? When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and harpazo, 
to take to make him a king he departed again into a mountain himself alone in john 10 12 but he that is an hireling and not the shepherd whose own the sheep are not seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth and the wolf catcheth them harpazo and scattereth the sheep this is a physical physical departure a physical snatching away a physical uh catching all right okay john 10 uh john 10 29 acts 8 39 and when they were come up out of the water the spirit of the lord caught away philip the spirit of the lord harpazoed philip he snatched philip he, he took philip out of there in an instant in the twinkling of an eye and he brought him to another location we know the story that the eunuch saw him no more and he went on his way rejoicing in acts 23 10 and when there arose a great dissension the chief captain fearing lest paul should have been pulled and pulled in pieces of them commanded the soldiers to go down and to what harpazo him take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle it is a physical removing second corinthians 12 2 i knew a man in christ about 14 years ago this is paul speaking whether in the body i cannot tell or whether out of the body i cannot tell god knoweth such a one caught up means such a one harpazo to the third heaven paul was physically caught from the earth paul was taken from the earth and brought instantly to the third heaven amen and that's exactly why paul knew about this rapture mystery he was shown what the rapture mystery was because god did it to him amen and god is going to do it to us when jesus sounds and and his and shouts at the sound of an archangel we will be harpazoed we will be caught up and we'll all be with him amen again the word harpazo is used 17 times in 13 different verses look at first thessalonians 4 17 we all know this one then we which are alive and remain shall be what harpazo caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the lord hallelujah jude 123 revelation 12 5 if you want to look at those so we see a, a clear difference between the word apostasia which means a falling away from the faith this is a an emotional falling away if you will a spiritual falling away okay and harpazo is a physical catching away two different words two different meanings the following way that's used in acts 21 21 and second thessalonians 2 is apostasia it is a spiritual uh unbelief it is a spiritual level of you know conviction being removed it is different than being snatched away so the falling away happens after the harpazo now there is another teaching out there that says that the falling away means to depart the earth in the harpazo they're teaching that the falling away means the rapture that's and i disagree wholeheartedly disagree and we just saw why the falling away apostasia in second thessalonians 2 is speaking about those in daniel's 70th week who will be led astray by the deception they will fall away they will forsake the one true living god throughout through the delusion for the false god the antichrist and the harpazo so the snatching away the removal of the body of christ will happen prior to the apostasia that takes place during the seven year period daniel 70th week okay moving along acts verse 22 what is it therefore the multitude must needs come together for they will hear that thou art come do therefore this that we say to thee we have four men which have a vow on them them take and purify thyself with them and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads and all know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing but that thou thyself also walkest orderly 
and keepest the law. Now, the Holy Spirit, writing through Luke, makes sure to clear this passage up for us Gentiles, the body of Christ, making it clear, very clear, that what Paul is about to do is not something for us today. Look at verse 25. As touching the who, the Gentiles, which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe what? No such thing save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. Now, second, Paul explains why he sometimes acted otherwise for the benefit of saving his Jewish kinsmen. He explains that in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, look at verse 19. For though, for though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak, I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. And why did Paul sometimes make himself a servant unto all, especially for Israel? Romans 10 verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. They had a zeal in the law, but not according to knowledge. Paul is thinking that they were in the last days. This is important to understand. Thinking that Daniel's 70th week was upon them. He would do anything to save his kinsmen at this point his Jewish brethren. First, Paul, traveling all over the place, would find the synagogues. He would prove to them, the Jews, and we know that there were always Gentiles present. So Paul would prove through scriptures to his Jewish brethren that Jesus was in fact the Messiah prophesied about by the prophets in the book of Psalms and Daniel and so on. Second, if the Jews understood and believed Paul, that Jesus was the Messiah, Paul would then move on, move on to explain why Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. You see, the gospel. This, of course, if they believed, were baptized by the Holy Spirit and added to the body of Christ. Now, if they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the, the prophets spoke about, then there was no need to explain death, burial, and resurrection. They didn't even believe in Jesus. They didn't believe Jesus was their Messiah. Instead, what we see are the Gentiles who are hearing Paul's plea to Israel, the Jews, the Gentiles being more apt, more able to understand, to believe the gospel of grace. Thus, the majority of souls saved were Gentiles, and they were added to the body of Christ. The more, ma majority of Jews rejected Paul's gospel. The majority of souls saved were Gentiles. So, Paul had a multi-pronged, attack, if you will. He preached to the Jews, and while preaching to the Jews, many of the Gentiles became believers because they were there. Paul was great at using his time wisely. He had to, because remember what I said, Paul was convinced that they were heading into the day of the Lord. He, he was convinced that the rapture was about to take place, and, and they were the rest of the world was going into Daniel's 70th week. Therefore, Paul did anything and everything necessary to plead with the seed of Jacob, the Jews, and that included what we read in 1 Thessalonians 9, 19. He became what he had to become as if, as a. You notice they use the words as, as, as. Well, he became as whatever just to convince them of the gospel. He's more concerned about their souls than, than all this material nonsense that we deal with. So he became as they so they would listen to his gospel and knowing that Paul's actions were to satisfy the kingdom saints and for the purpose of saving uh, his Jewish brethren we lead into verse 
26. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself, went them, with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification, until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews, which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. Okay, they're very angry. Even still, Paul performing some ritual wasn't enough. Here we see the Galatians, Jewish Galatians, believing in the law more than in faith of Christ Jesus alone, causing problems for Paul even all the way in Jerusalem. The Galatians traveled all the way from Asia down to Jerusalem to take part in the feast. So, verse 28, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law in this place, and further brought Greeks into also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. Here they're lying, making up stories, especially saying that Paul was forsaking or staging an apostasia, an apostasy against the laws of Moses to get Paul in trouble. Verse 29, For they had seen before with him in the city of Trophimus an Ephesian, <clears throat> whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. Verse 31, And as they went about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band, that all Jerusalem <clears throat> was in an uproar, who immediately took soldiers and centurions, and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. Then, the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. And we see the fulfillment of the prophecy that Agabus made back in verse 10. In verse 34, And some cried one thing, some another, uh, among the multitude. And when he could not know the certainty for the tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. And when he, ha when he came upon the stairs, so it was that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people, for the multitude of the people followed after, crying away with him. And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee, who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Art not thou that Egyptian, which before these days made us an uproar, and led us out into the wilderness four thousand men that were murderers? But Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, Now this is Paul speaking in the Hebrew tongue, being most likely Aramaic, which undoubtedly got their attention. He's going to explain to the Jews here what happened back in 34 AD. Now, this would be 23 years ago. So, Paul became a believer 23 years ago, all the way back in Acts chapter 9, and he's going to explain to the Jews exactly what happened all the way back uh, in Damascus, all the way back then, his confrontation with Christ Jesus. And chapter 21 ends here. So, that's the end of this study. Until next study, peace, love, grace of Christ Jesus be with all of you. Lord willing, I'll see you all on the next video in Acts chapter 22.